Alton Harden here with Microgrinder Poker School, and for today, we've got a Play and Explain video series for you. This is a 15 minute sample of our Play and Explain video series that we offer at Microgrinder Poker School for our All Access Pass members. So enjoy, and I hope you like the video. Hello everybody, this is Reggie Time for Micro Grinder Poker School and we're making a couple of or a handful of um play and explain videos for Micro Grinder Poker School. Looking forward to getting back involved with Alton again. It's been a while since we've collaborated, but I think um we're gonna be producing some really sweet content for you guys over the coming weeks and months and hopefully you guys really do get involved and and get a lot from it. The more you put into it, the more you're definitely going to get out of it, that's for sure. And um, hopefully, as we go along, we'll be explaining what we're doing and why. I think the Jack-9 suited middle position is a marginal open. When we get squeezed, it's a really easy fold. We're not going to be opening super wide here because I don't believe at the micro stakes, opening super wide is really the most sensible thing to do. Rake's a huge issue. And you want to primarily be opening like really playable hands and only really opening more of the rubbish stuff or more of the weaker stuff from from the latest of positions. We're not going to be doing too many like opening too many small cards from early position for example. We're not, probably not going to be opening too many small pairs either. If you would like to know my recommended opening ranges for um, the micro stakes, especially if you're not already a successful player, then please do get in touch and I'd be happy to to share them with you. I'm not sure if Alton's going to find somewhere to put them on the site or not, but if he doesn't um, I'm happy to share them. If he finds somewhere to put them, then I'll put them there for all to see. <clears throat> Hopefully we're getting some interesting situations. It's just going to be a 20 minute video. Hopefully we'll find some interesting situations between now and then, or at least um, getting some spots where we can explain what I'm doing and why, and what I believe I do differently to many players at the micro stakes it makes me one of the more successful lower micro stakes players probably that there is around I was talking about the idea of 3 bit in the 4-3 there which I think is fine but I'd rather know much more about my opponent before I start doing that we we need to know if we're going to have like have an opponent for a lot of 3 bits if he doesn't then we're not going to be wanting to 3 bit 4 high very often the ace check here is a very easy check call, blind versus blind. Um, it's like very much like a category two hand, and category two hands are hands that have showdown value that we can absolutely check and call bets with, but maybe doesn't get too much value when they bet. Now we've seen our opponent check back on the flop. I think it then becomes a category one value bet hand. The categories are something that I picked up from Doug Polk. There's essentially just four categories. Category one, which is your strongest value hands that you can value bet for multiple streets assuming that the board doesn't change too much category two is hands that we're going to be usually checking or calling with or check calling with category three are going to be our semi bluffs and category four are usually going to be our give ups unless our opponent shows like immense weakness and then we can sometimes can turn category fours into like pure bluffs really standard three bet with the pocket kings versus under the gun and usually I would go for small bets here um, if our opponent was fully stacked, but since he isn't, we're just going to like, bet big flop or bet relatively big on flop and just shove the turn unless he shoves over us. I mean, the two is a completely safe card and that we're just going to put our opponent all in. We can get caught by all kinds of worse hands, jack X, flush draws, even pocket eights, pocket nines, that type of thing, who might just put us on ace king and, and pay us off. We're not going to open the force from middle position. I think it's the kind of hard to play post flop for, for many players and unless we flop a set we don't really make much money with them and I've found personally that it's really difficult to um, to make money from the first seat maybe even the second seat with, with pairs deuces through five so I the only time I will open them is if there's some like really really tight players behind me who I think are just going to fold all the time or there's like a major fish in the blinds that's usually when I'm going to be doing that. Otherwise, we're just going to muck the force. We're not going to be defending anything versus min raises really from early position either. We muck the four two off there. 
Um, I know a lot of people advocate like defending very, very wide versus min raises, but for Dusov just isn't going to get the job done. Jack Dusov the same here. Very likely he's got a very wide range from min opening the button, but nevertheless Jack 2 is just a really, really weak borderline unplayable holding that we just don't need to be getting involved with. Some of the biggest mistakes I see people make is when they make like really loose defends pre-flop versus small opens and then just get completely lost post-flop when they kind of hit little bits and pieces that aren't really worth very much but nevertheless they, they, they never really know when to fold them. We're going to fold the ace deuce to the three bet. We can sometimes think about four bet bluffing there with our suited wheel aces but I don't think we need to in this occasion. We don't know enough about an opponent. Again, somebody who's playing 100% of hands so far, over just three hands. Oh, I was. Um, yeah, we're going to three bet the king queen and just sigh and call if he jams, which I think is pretty likely. But given he's played like all three hands so far, he's going to have a pretty wide range, one would imagine. And he just folds anyway. He opens under the gun and folds. Pretty fast action here on um, Party Poker Fast Forward. Not too much time to get into super deep discussion. If we do have an interesting hand, um, we will go back and review it um, once we decide to open the nines we guess we have to call it off the guy's limp jamming from early position he's going to have a relatively strong range here but at the same time um, it's just so so little money it's like what is it 20 odd blinds once we isolate I think it would be setting money on fire to, to then fold it even though people's limp raises limp, range, limp raise ranges are usually very very strong um, I still think Nines is strong enough to stack off first the limp raise pre for 25 blinds. We need to defend this ace jack. It's less than five big blinds. We need to defend the pocket eights versus a guy who doesn't seem to raise too much. Easy check call with the ace jack. I'm going to let the eights go here. We can't really call down on this board. Two over cards and already a potential flush draw out there. We're just going to keep check calling with our ace jack. It's going to serve best as a bluff catcher, I think. If we value bet, it's going to be hard to get called by worse. Maybe only ace queen can call us there, or possibly king jack if he's into three betting king jack pre, which I don't think too many people are versus under the gun. Pocket eight's here, really easy check back. Again, it's a, it's a category two hand. It's got marginal showdown value and very little else. If he bets the turn here, we're just going to fold. We don't beat very much at all. We beat some like spade draws, some heart draws this turn. But most of the time, it's just going to be value betting a hand that has us crushed. When we see bet the two over cards and the good shot with the backdoor flush draw. Once the board double pairs. I don't even think we get people ace high here very often. So it's a situation I'm usually just willing to give up on. Interesting that we river the straight. I think we have to pay off versus the river when we river the straight. He can have some flushes, some full houses, but um, I think it's just too strong. And he does have the backdoor flush. It's not nice having to pay off in those situations, but um, he's going to have a lot of maybe just over pairs that he just wants to bet for value. Some ace highs that he's kind of trying to get some a chop with, etc. It's not nice. I don't like paying off. You're going to see me over the course of the next few videos making quite a lot of tight folds when people lead into us but when we have straights in small pots even on like double paired flushing boards we kind of need to call them down but we're not going to be calling down very light at all hopefully I, I, well I don't want nobody wants to make big folds but hopefully I get a chance to demonstrate some big folds over the over the course of the next few videos have a pair and an open ender here in a multi-way pot not then to get too excited about I typically check back these boards a lot yeah we have some decent equity with second pair with an open ender but it's the sort of board we're going to get check raised on a lot and it's also the sort of board that we're not going to want to see it very often it's like super coordinated it doesn't rate to hit us too hard once we turn the straight we'll just bet big fall to a raise I think anyone's going to raise us here with like a worse hand very often maybe maybe from time to time someone might just take like the naked ace or king of hearts and and choose to bluff with it but in these games i think that's like super rare way more likely someone's just going to have a flush or a bigger straight very dry board here we're just going to stab small and 
reevaluate turn if we get cold. But the small sea bets on super dry boards um, work really well. It's something you should be trying to work into your game. Not necessarily doing it with hands as weak as Ace Eight, possibly, but nevertheless, I think it's something you need to be at least trying to do. I know a lot of people I work with, a lot of people I coach, they have a real hard time with the small sea bets because they just don't think they're going to get enough folds. But on load on dry, dry boards in single race pots, you get a ton of folds. People just miss so often. When well, not sea bet in the six, eight, ten board, it hits a button calling range, button three bet calling range, way harder than it hits our. Three betting range, you know, our three betting range is going to be like high cards and big pairs mostly. And we probably have more combinations of just high cards than we do big pairs. Just not a good board for us to continue on, really. If we had backdoor clubs, maybe we could consider it. We're just going to check down here. Now, we could overbet to try and make him fold ace high, etc., but we're just going to give up and just allow him to pick up the pot and he just doesn't bluff at any point there with king queen i think if i was him i would have found a bet somewhere there with king queen because we're just gonna have too many ace highs it's just gonna win against him <clears throat> i think our opponent made a mistake there by allowing us to chop that pot when we pretty much just giving it to him we conceded the pot to him at a very early stage and he didn't take it away from us which does demonstrate a point i strongly believe which is in these games people just do not bluff anywhere near enough as they should do post flop Therefore, if people aren't bluffing as much as they should be post-flop, we should be finding lots and lots of reasons to fold. Unless we can be really confident that our opponent's got like, a ton of bluffs in his range. <clears throat> so obviously you can get some boards sometimes where like, they've checked call twice and every draw's missed and it's lead the river. Then we can we can think about making some folds, but it's, it's very rare you'll catch me making and calls with with one pair on rivers win and there aren't too many bluffs people can have i mean we can always know people can have just random bluffs that they, that they do from time to time when they're just desperately trying to win the pot but those guys will soon become apparent to you you soon know who they are but the guys with the bit with the high one when sort of flop factors the guy with the high the guys with the high aggression frequencies things like that you'll soon know who they are i think the overall message you want to get across is don't pay off without a bloody good reason. If you haven't got a good reason to pay off, don't do it. And the top pair is not a good enough reason to pay off. You need to be able to put, you know, not name all the bluffs your opponent can have, but understand that like, there's plenty of draws that I've missed here or what have you, or I've taken a line that can possibly induce my opponent to make some, some bluffs. Don't just do it because I've got top pair, so I have to call. That's not a good enough reason. <clears throat> I think we're going to triple barrel here with our open ender. There's lots of like pair plus draws he can have that aren't going to be able to take three streets of heat. But fortunately, the second barrel got the job done. Again, this isn't a board I'm going to be sea betting very often against a player that I suspect might be a fish given his stack size. They're just not going to be prone to folding ace high, they're not going to be prone to folding any pair. So we're just going to um, give up. We do, I, do, I do more giving up than lots of people, but when I do start betting post flop, I'm putting myself in situations where I can bet multiple streets so when I, d I don't see bet as often as many many players but i probably double and triple barrel once i do start see betting more than most usually in either value situations or situations where i've got either really strong backdoor equity or just really strong equity <clears throat> i think that's something that you guys should be trying to bring into your game too don't start off just betting at pots for no other reason than oh i, I need to bet to win you know, you want to have some kind of <clears throat> backup plan too for if your see bet doesn't work. You want to have some equity or some backdoor equity or maybe you have a read <clears throat> that your opponent falls to way too many see bets. Now this guy here, we haven't got enough hands on him, but at the minute it's falling to 100% of see bets. So um, if that was the case over 400 hands rather than 40 hands, that he was falling to say 75% of see bets. And we can see about almost any two against those guys and just give up. But typically, you, you don't want to be employing that strategy unless you have a damn good reason.
to defend the ace queen here versus someone who looks like they might be reasonably aggressive. Good shot on a backdoor flush draw, which is somewhat interesting depending on how the action goes from here. You see bet in a three bet pot into two players. We do have a good shot in the back door, but we're going to let it go. When someone C bets into two players in a three bet pot, it's very likely they're right up at the top of their range, and we don't want to be taking good shots on paired boards against the top of people's ranges very often. And a bit really small here on the flop with our ace queen. Two over cards, back door, flush draw, back door, straight draw. Lots of turn cards. We can double barrel on any green ones, any cards higher than a 10. And there's going to be lots of reasonable turns for us. And if we don't hit any of those, then we will just give up. We hit the queen, which is nice. And I'm going to squeeze the queen 10 suited here. Because that opponent looks like he's got a really high 4-3 to three bet. And the other guy looks pretty loose. And you bet the ace queen here on the turn. Folding if we get raised. Then... I hope that you enjoyed this free tutorial. If you did... Please be sure to give it a like, and if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do so. And also, if you have any comments or questions, please be sure to leave them down below in the comment area. Now, if you're really looking to improve your poker game, be sure to head on over to Microgrinder Poker School's website, microgrinder.com, where we have premium courses and tutorials, as well as strategy articles to help you become a better Micro 6 poker player. So again, thanks for watching, and I hope you guys have an awesome day. Take care.